You know the expression, when something sounds too good to be true, it probably is? Like a peak capable printer for less than the cost of a roll of peak filament? Well, sometimes, just sometimes, it actually is true. But there's some caveats to that. When I was first approached by this brand, Aliarchy, to make a review of this printer, the Alchemin, I was intrigued but skeptical. It's a hobby printer in both price and aesthetics, but a professional grade printer in performance, at least on paper. You've got these kind of kitschy graphics and the gamer style RGB lights, which don't necessarily inspire a lot of confidence. But then on the other hand, you've got a 450 degree hot end, 130 degree bed, and a 90 degree heated chamber, making this printer capable of handling engineering grade materials like Peak, PEC, and Altum. Printers with these specs normally cost upwards of $10,000 on the low end. This one is available at a Kickstarter early bird price of just $650 or $950 with the five color multi-material module. I've already done a preliminary review of this printer. So if you wanna see how this performs, make sure to check that out. In that video, I discussed a variety of issues I noticed during my short time of testing. Like the fact that the motion system was kind of wimpy on account of the thin unsupported linear rails resulting in multiple secondary resonances in the input shaping results. And the bed was far from flat. I showed some of my results with basic PLA and then jumped in the deep end trying to print peak. I had some successes and some failures. But after printing just a few small peak prints, the hot end disintegrated. The silicone sock crumbled and the Kapton tape that was holding the thermistor to the heater block went with it. So I relayed this feedback to the brand as well as communicating all the other issues I experienced during my time of testing. I also posed some questions to them concerning component longevity and other things that you, my viewers, wanted to know. And I've got answers. You know who else has answers? The teachers on Skillshare, the largest online learning community for makers, designers, and creatives, and a sponsor for this video. Skillshare is a great resource for learning new skills, exploring new ideas, or sharpening existing expertise. There's courses covering all aspects of designing for 3D printing, like this one on Fusion 360 for structured modeling, or this one on Blender for organic modeling. If you're interested in turning your passion for 3D printing into a business, Skillshare also has courses on entrepreneurship, which can teach you how to start your own Etsy store. With thousands of courses spanning a multitude of topics, Skillshare is a great resource for learning. The first 500 people to use my link in the description will receive a one month free trial to Skillshare. Get started today and take your 3D printing and design skills to the next level. So in this video, I'd like to communicate to you all of the changes that Eliarchy has already committed to making to the Alchemist and how they responded to questions about how their machine will hold up over time with extended exposure to elevated temperatures. But before I tell you that, let me just remind you that this is a Kickstarter project. Regardless of how good or bad any of this sounds, you should know that it can all change in an instant. This printer could be the next big thing or the next big flaw. Exercise caution and don't invest money you're not willing to lose. All right, let's get into it. A lot of the components on this prototype were SLS 3D printed. In the production printer, those will be replaced with injection molded parts. The hot end will be revamped to replace the Kapton tape with a glass fiber sleeve for fixation of the thermistor and a high temp rubber as opposed to the normal silicone for the sock. The motion system will be enhanced with 9mm rails used in place of the current 7mm ones. They've also said that the belts will be widened, but I'm not sure by how much. The belt material will be changed from a standard rubber to a high temperature resistant polyurethane that is stable up to 120 degrees. When asked about the bed flatness issue, they said they would adjust the four point leveling screws using precision tools to ensure the heated bed is as flat as possible before shipping. In my review, I mentioned how the magnetic sticker that holds the steel sheet would be replaced by fixed magnets on account of the fact that a magnetic sticker will lose its strength at elevated temperatures. That caused a bit of confusion because fixed magnets are known to be incompatible with scanning probes, which the Elkman uses for bed mesh generation. It turns out that this is only true of large fixed magnets. Eliarchy has assured me that the magnets they're using don't interfere with the scanning probe. There was also a concern about the maximum operating temperature of this probe, especially given its close proximity to the heated bed. Eliarchy has indicated that the MCU for the probe will be relocated from the probe itself to be integrated with the MCU of the toolhead board. In my testing, I found that the Z height was inconsistent at elevated temperatures, 
which is a known limitation of non-contact probes. In the released version of the Alkman's firmware, they'll enable nozzle touch probing, similar to beacon contact, which will make the Z offset automatic and robust to changes in temperature. Another concern was the placement of the thermistor that measures chamber temperature. On this prototype version, it's integrated with the tool head bore. Given that the tool head electronics can generate heat in normal operation, this won't provide an accurate measurement of the ambient air temperature. To address this, the chamber thermistor will be relocated to a fixed position on the frame of the printer. Given that this Alkman has a rated chamber temperature of 90 degrees, it's vitally important to ensure that all of the components within can withstand prolonged exposure to these temperatures. Very few standard electronics are rated for such, so they pretty much all need to be high temperature rated components specially selected for this purpose. Among these are the motors. When asked about these in particular, Eliarchy had this to say. To prevent heat buildup from accelerating motor aging, the new version will feature insulated compartments, heat sinks, and exhaust fans for all motors inside the chamber. I also asked them about the camera and the RGB lights. Their answer didn't inspire as much confidence. They said, according to testing, both the camera and RGB lights are rated to withstand extended exposure to 90 degrees. This sounds to me like they did their own testing of off-the-shelf components and deemed them to be suitable, rather than sourcing high temperature rated versions. I could be wrong, but that's how I read it. According to their Kickstarter page, their cumulative testing only totaled 4,000 hours, which isn't much in the grand scheme of things. Split over multiple printers, that's less than 1,000 hours per machine. Based on my experience, the 1,000 hour mark is about when most printers start to show issues related to long-term wear and tear. So are they or aren't they rated for long-term exposure to 90 degrees? I'm not sure, but honestly, if you're using this printer to print peak, the last thing you probably care about is some flashy lights. So even if they do die eventually, it won't be that big of a loss. In my time printing peak on the Alchemin, I experienced a few overheating errors of the Toolhead MCU. When I asked about this, I was told that the error was mainly caused by the system detecting high motor driver temperatures. In such cases, it's recommended to reduce the speed of printing to within a reasonable range or to use the parameters they provide. Peak needs to be printed slowly anyways. So if the slower printing has the secondary benefit of limiting the temperatures on the extruder stepper driver, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. They indicated to me that the motor drivers they're using are among the best on the market, with an operating temperature range from minus 55 degrees Celsius to plus 155. During high temperature printing, the motor driver temperatures typically range from 105 to 120, so I'm told. Another issue I experienced during my time of testing was timer too close, which indicates a communication error between the clipper firmware and one of the MCUs. In this case, it seemed to be the one on the toolhead board. Eliarchy's response to this issue was one of the most insightful I received. They pointed to two potential root causes. The first was cable connection issues. The toolhead board is connected via a single bus cable that runs through a cable chain. For this prototype, they used manually pressed wiring, which resulted in some communication quality problems. For the final production printer, I'm told that they'll be switching to large scale mechanical pressing, which will effectively resolve this issue. I'm going to recommend that they also change how the cables are connected on the other end. These solder joints are weak and easy to break. The second potential root cause is resource overload. This stems from three sources. The first is the RGB lights. These can be changed programmatically, which is quite processor intensive. These currently use 30% of the CPU power of the main control board. In the production printer, they'll be adding a dedicated MCU to control these lights. The second potential cause is the thermistor a PT-1000 sensor. For some reason, they had this connected through an amplifier circuit. Typically, this is only required for the lower resistance, higher accuracy PT-100 sensors. These have a smaller resistance change per unit increase of temperature, which makes them more accurate, but the signal needs to be amplified. The amplifier connects to the toolhead MCU via SPI, a serial interface. Due to the real-time temperature control needs, it frequently sends temperature data, causing communication delays. In the production printer, they'll be eliminating the amplifier circuit and connecting the thermistor directly to the toolhead MCU. Why they wired it this way in the first place is uncertain. Perhaps they intended to use a PT100, but later decided it was overkill and went for the PT1000 instead. At any rate, this explanation that they provided indicates to me that they have a good grasp on the electrical engineering aspect of 3D printer design. 
The third and final source they pointed to as a potential root cause for the communication delays was the motor compensation commands. Given the lack of rigidity in the motion system, the firmware has to compensate a lot to counteract the vibrations. This should be mitigated with the increase in rigidity resulting from the change to thicker rails and belts. Shifting focus now, let's talk about the multi-material module, the VU. This seems to still be in development, but here's what we know so far. It uses the Happy Hair Clipper module for control. It has five lanes for five different filaments. You can update the input color assignment from the touchscreen, the UI for which has been improved since my testing. The test they showed of it operating was a little underwhelming, being very basic in nature. And it's clear they have some work to do to refine the filament purging sequence. They've indicated that they're updating the nozzle wiping solution, but I no longer see a purge container, so I don't know what the plan is for that. In an answer to a backer question on Kickstarter, they seemed to indicate that the purge might be pelletized. They said, and I quote, we have optimized the discharge position and introduced a new nozzle wiping mechanism. This mechanism transforms waste material morphology from filamentous strands into compact agglomerates. I'm picturing something like this, but that might just be a really fancy way of saying their printer poops. But more important than any of the bells and whistles is safety. When probed on this topic, they pointed to a few notable safety features. They've indicated that the chamber heating components use flame retardant materials. This includes newly added insulation, which will be incorporated in the side panels to aid in heat retention. They've also incorporated thermal fuses for both the chamber heater and the bed that will trip if the temperature exceeds a safe limit. And they have standard safety protections for short circuit and over temperature of the power supply and motherboard. So I think you'll agree that there's some meaningful changes here. The printer in this form had potential, but it was rough around the edges. If they're able to implement all of these changes and deliver at the promised price, it will be a real contender. But even if they're able to pull it off, is a 90 degree chamber even enough to print peak? One of the most common comments I received on my review was that 90 degrees just wasn't enough. Industrial peak printers have chamber temperatures in the 120 degree range or higher, and it's for good reason. Higher chamber temperatures help prevent the part from warping when printed in its fully crystalline state, which is preferred for achieving maximum strength. You can print peak in the amorphous state and anneal afterwards to crystallize, but the end results may not be as good. So you probably won't be achieving peak performance on large prints with this lower chamber temperature, but it should be perfectly all right for smaller parts. Another printer to compare to would be the Element HT from Mosaic Manufacturing at a retail price of 10,000 USD. With a maximum chamber temperature of 80 degrees, the critics will say it's not a peak printer, but it is advertised as such. The caveat is that it's not optimized for large peak prints, which they state. The same is true of the Alchemist, but they're not as forthcoming in saying so. But realistically, most of us won't be printing this. At close to $1,000 per kilogram, it's way overkill for most applications. The Alchemist is still a really solid all-round printer that can handle other materials with ease. But if you say your Ferrari can go from 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds and also handles well on corners, which do you think will grab the most attention? Trouble is, if it can't accelerate that fast, it doesn't matter how well it handles. You will have already broken the trust. So if Eliarchy can't deliver on their peak promises, it almost doesn't matter how good their printer is otherwise. It does seem like they're on the right track, especially with all of the changes they've made. But we'll have to wait and see how it pans out. Stay tuned and get subscribed if you'd like to see that video. Thanks for watching. My name's Taylor, this is YGK3D, and until next time, happy 3D 